Welcome everybody to our Hope Captain evening where we're going to play disaster trivia. And the reason we're doing that is we think it's a good engagement tool for our communities, um, how to get people to pay attention to the a topic of preparedness in a fun way that, that gets, gets other people to the table who might not come to a you know, evening meeting. So tonight our host is gonna be Erica Harnett. She and the members of the Highland Park um, Hub have worked really hard to put together a set of um, trivia questions that work well in this um, pandemic environment where we're doing everything virtual. So I'm gonna turn it over to Erica and she's going to, we're gonna do a little demonstration for you. Welcome. So we're gonna do this in two parts. We're gonna have a round one and a round two. Round one, we're gonna demonstrate what it's like when you don't have an audience. Um, and participants so we can go through step by step and explain how we're doing it and why we're what we're what we're doing this and the reasons why. Um, and then we'll come back with round two and we'll have participants and you can see what it's like to have multiple people involved on a zoom meeting and have them breaking out into breakout rooms and what that live interaction is like. Each round you only want to have it take about 20 to 30 minutes 30 minutes tops. Uh, so we'll see that in each round, there's probably only a between about nine or 10 questions for each round, um, except for if there's a lightning round, you can go a little faster. Um, so if it get, goes on too long, people start losing interest, they start chatting with their friends. They, so you wanna keep it short. Um, and the other thing you'll see what I'll do is I'll read each question twice. In the virtual environment, it's a, not quite as important to do that because I'll ha also have the questions up. Um, in a live environment where you may, the people may not be able to see the questions and there might be noise in the background, reading a question multiple times is good so, be, so that people can make sure they heard it right the first time. Uh, then what we'll do is we'll, we'll I'll read through all of the questions and everybody in the virtual environment writes down and takes notes of what their answers should be. Then what, we'll, what you will do in a virtual environment is you, you can make use of the Zoom breakout rooms and you allow how you've either, you've either predefined people or you do it on the fly to go into their breakout rooms and give them a limited amount of time in order to, to confer. You don't wanna give them a large amount of time, only give them a few minutes to get in, sort of settle down and have maybe like one or two minutes for discussion. And this is the point where they get to confer with each other. If they did not have, a, if they had a question that they couldn't answer, then they get to comp get to compare with e each, each other in their breakout rooms and settle on an a question. And then we come back, I will go through the answers and each team will score their own, uh, their own score in, in the virtual environment. And then we'll have them report at the end what we would have them report at the end what their scores were. Yeah, I, I'll add in that uh, generally, if when you send them off to their breakout rooms, you need to tell them how much time they're going to have, because uh, sometimes they they don't know each other and introductions are made, and some teams are very democratic. You know, they want to hear what everybody voted, and others are really more efficient. Like, did we all say answer this? And you have to allow time for arguments because that's part of the that's part of the learning process. So, pick ten minutes or fifteen minutes, but tell them ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. And so, and and the thing is, you want to make sure you don't want to give them too much time that everybody gets the right answer. Because yes, it's a learning environment. But one of the things that in that's a little easier to do in in person is potentially have prizes. Um, so you need to be able to have somebody who won in order to offer prizes. Yep. Uh, it's a little harder to do in the virtual environment to have prizes. You're doing it virtually. It really does help to have your host focus on the host and you have a technical person help and do kind of the, the mechanics in the background, just Perfect. like we're doing tonight. Round one of our Hub Captain trivia. Now, uh, and I'm gonna, as I mentioned, I'm gonna read through the questions twice. Uh, one thing I've done for um, in this uh, for this one is most of the questions are actually going to evolve or revolve around the topic of earthquake early warning. Uh, the reason why I'm doing that is that's earthquake early warning system is going to be coming online in Washington State this year, and there's going to be a big push. So this is this gives an example of if there is some particular campaign that's happening, you can actually bring focus to that campaign 
through the trivia questions that you actually guide and and sort of cultivate for your trivia. So you can have multiple trivia nights and each one might have center around whatever that year's uh, disaster preparedness campaign happens to be or what your local campaign might happen to be. So our first question is approximately how long does the ground shake during a large, so we're talking about 9.0 magnitude subduction zone earthquake. This is the very, very intense earthquakes that happen very rarely happen on the ring of fire that are very, that stand out. So what, the 10, are we thinking 10 to 15 seconds? 30 to 40 seconds? One to two minutes? Or three to 10 minutes? So. Hi. And I, of course, am writing down what I think my answer is, and so is Anne. So a reminder, these are, this is the duration of the, the very intense subduction zone earthquakes. So we're looking at 10 to 15 seconds, 30 to 40 seconds, one to two minutes, or three to 10 minutes. Next question. How much warning do earthquake early warning systems typically provide? So these will be the systems like are going to be coming on in, in Washington state this year. One to 10 seconds, one to five minutes, one to two hours, one to two days. So we're looking at these old, if you signed up potentially on your phone for the earth, the getting an alert, if there's a, for the earthquake early warning system, are you going to be given a few seconds, a couple of minutes? maybe an hour or maybe a day of, of warning. What do earthquake early warning systems detect to trigger to sending a warning to via these apps that might be on the phone or some other system that picks up the warning? Are they picking up increased strain by seismometers on faults? So we have strain measurements on, on the uh, faults that seismologists put out. Are they, are they measuring precursor earthquakes? Are they, some people have said that prior to an earthquake that the animals change behavior and they start acting differently as this, are they using this type of reports? Or are they detecting early seismic waves at the beginning of an earthquake? So again, this is what is the earthquake early warning system detecting in order to trigger sending a warning out to everyone who has enabled one of these systems. Are they looking at the strain on a fault? Small precursor earthquakes? Changes in animal behavior? Or early seismic waves at the beginning of an earthquake? Sure or false? Earthquake early warning systems are new technology that haven't been tested in, in lar during large earthquakes. So uh, Washington State's earthquake early warning system is gonna be coming online this year. Have other places had earthquake early warning systems online during an actual earthquake and had them, and had them turn on and, and sent out uh, warnings, true or false? Question five. Which are examples of how earthquake early warning systems can be used? They can send elevators to the nearest floor and open the doors. So something is built into the, the, the technology of the elevator to send everybody who might be in an elevator to the nearest floor. Can they stop trains and light rail and have them come to a stop wherever they might be at? Or send, can they be, can people use them to take cover or brace for imminent shaking? Can they be used to shut down assembly lines? Or can they be used for all of the above? So we have some system that picks up the signal sent out by an earthquake whirly warning system. Can they be picked up by elevators to be sent to send them to the nearest floor, stop trains or light rail? And can people using them on their phone use that as a, in, in, an opportunity to take cover or brace for shaking? Um, can they be used to shut down assembly lines or can it be used all of the above?
after a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, so this would be a large subduction zone off the coast of Washington, how long afterwards would Seattle be risk for a tsunami in Puget Sound? So this would be an earthquake that would be happening off the coast of Washington. But if there is a tsunami that impacts Seattle, how long would it take for that tsunami to show up? Would it be two to five minutes? 20 to 30 minutes? One to three hours? Or one to two days? So if they're shaking on due to the subduction zone off the coast of Washington, the tsunami, due to the subduction zone earthquake, the large, the large tsunami that might hit the coast of Washington afterwards, how long would it take for that to, to reach the Seattle via Puget Sound and the, and the Salish Sea? Two to five minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, one to three hours, or one to two days. Which is not a warning that a tsunami might be imminent for making landfall. So we've been talking about the earthquake early warning system, but if we don't have that, which can you not use? If you see the water at a beach receding rapidly, a loud roaring noise coming from the ocean, a very tall wall of water coming to shore. And when I mean, when I say tall water, I'm saying like, like a couple hundred feet or tens of feet of water. So this is the, the height of maybe like a container ship. Think tall, a tall wall of water coming towards shore. Local shaking. If you can feel an earthquake, are you at risk for, for a tsunami? So remember, this is the one that is not going to be an indicator that a tsunami might be imminent for making landfall. Our last question, and this is an opinion question, and as you're working through them, uh, if in your team, there's not a, one, a correct answer, but everyone on your team has to agree on the answer. So, so there is, if you, when you send your teams out into a breakout room, they have to all agree on which superhero they would like to recruit to be part of their hub to help them during an emergency. Superman, our man of steel. Wonder Woman with her invisible jet and lasso of truth. Iron Man and all of his technology wonders. For the more hardcore of you, of the superhero, Domino, the lucky Domino who always manages to have everything turn out her way. Or Rocket and Groot, the masters of barter trade and borrowing. So that's our final question. So reminder that this last question is an opinion one, but you all of your on your team have to agree. So at that I will stop sharing. And at this point, you would be giving your teams uh, instructions on how you're going to break them out. And or um, in person, you, this would be a, a chance for if you're doing this as an in-person event, this is the point where you would go around and collect the answer sheets. Um, usually having somebody help you do the collection of the answer sheets that you would then go through, they would be then scoring the answer sheets while you do round two. In the virtual environment, we're gonna have people score their own answer sheets after they've had time to confer. Right, so the thing we've learned is to say, as you send them into the breakout rooms, uh, what Erica had already said about you have to, you guys have to agree on the answer and you have to really, it makes sense to appoint someone the scribe so that when Erica is reading off the answers, they're going, yep, we said that, we said that, nope, we missed that. And then the opinion one is clearly a gimme. So if nothing, if all they could do was agree on someone, they at least get one point for the round. So, so I think, I think that, and, and so sending people into the breakout rooms, that's where you have your tech person who maybe was behind the scenes as Erica was reading it, kind of assigning people into however we agree, you know, was agreed at the start of, okay, here we're gonna go. So when you go off into the uh, breakout room, they cannot chat. 
So it, when you're in the main group, people can chat, but you can't chat with people when you're in the breakout room. But there is a way to, you know, flag the host to say, please come into our breakout room because we're having an argument or, or, or whatever. But generally, you don't do that because you don't repeat people's questions, you know, special. But you, you have the ability also in breakout rooms to give them a five minute warning, a two minute warning. You want to give them something more than a 45 second warning, because if they got stuck on question three, you want to give them at least enough time to realize they, they wasted their time and they got to get through those last answers. Okay, so Erica, you want to pick it up and give us our answers? Because so you stumped me on one of these. Okay, yeah. we sent everyone <laughs> out into the breakout rooms. We called them back. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go through the answers. And one of the things you're going to see that I'm going to do is as I go through the answers, I'm actually going to explain the answer. Because as Cindy mentioned at the beginning, this isn't just supposed to be fun to do the questions. It's supposed to be also be a sort of a low key fun environment way to learn. So being able to go through and explain the answers is part of that learning. Um, and this is so I do have a bit of an earth science background. Um, but for these questions, every single question I looked up, I had to go to the web and look up the, uh, some of the answers and get, get the documentation. So, and it took me for these questions, maybe about an hour to go through and get all of them. Um, so so you, you, you'll be doing some research and this is actually something in, in a hub environment where you can actually get your volunteers. So if you have volunteers and somebody who's like really into searching the web and doing research, have them be your research person, have them come up with the questions or work with them. So this is actually can also be putting together the trivia questions and doing the research and coming up with the explanation and the documentation and the links. We'll have some of the ones that I've done on our hub captains and um, uh, information and in the our resources, but this can also be an engagement tool and how to get your, your volunteers engaged. Um, re recruit some of them to help you research questions. Erica, I can't remember on the hub captains thing. Do you have them in groupings? Like you'll, like people will be able to go there and say, "Oh, I want the trivia night set for early Worthkirk warning and the trivia set for general preparedness." Right. I haven't named them that yet, but I will. Um, I will okay. do that. So, and and we do for the we also have the question banks, and the question banks have those um, in there. So we have question banks. The sort of the background and giving the context and the learning aspect um, has not been all filled in. Um, okay. I filled in some. Everybody else gets to help with some of that as well. As as, okay. every, as different hubs do different questions, we'll all sort of backfill in with that information. Great. All right, I'm ready. Okay, so let's go in through and score. And so I'm going to share my screen again. So our answers. So approximately how long does the ground shake during a large subduction zone earthquake? Not 10 to 15 seconds, not 30 to 40 seconds, not even one to two minutes. It can be three to 10 minutes long. Um, if for those of you who might have been here during the, uh, during the Nisqually earthquake uh, back in 2000, or is it 2001? 2001. Uh, it, 2001. It may have felt like three to 10 minutes, but then the Zawali earthquake only lasted 40 seconds. The, just to give some, some, I've got the numbers and these are included in the slides. The 2011 Japanese earthquake that we're all very familiar with, that lasted for six minutes. People were feeling shaking for six minutes. The, the very well-known Alaska earthquake in 1964, where the, the Sea of Valdez or the, um, um, uh, emptied out and there was the large tsunami, that one lasted for four and a half minutes. The winner of, so far we know, of recorded earthquakes. In 1960, there was a large 9.0 earthquake in Chile. People felt shaking for 10 minutes after that one. Wow. So that, that's one of the reasons, so the shaking is intense for these large subduction zone earthquakes, but the, one of the aspects that makes them so destructive is because the shaking goes on for so long. Um, an analogy is, think of it is if you've taken a spoon and you start to bend a spoon back and forth, 
you do that once or twice, you can still use the spoon. The structural integrity is not great, but you're not going to notice it. But if you keep bending that spoon back and forth, back and forth, you're going to snap the spoon. So that's where, where some of the intensity of the destruction for these large earthquakes comes from, even for distributed, because they go on for so long. OK, cool. So how much warning do earthquake early warning systems typically provide? They actually only give about one to 10 seconds of warning. So it's not a few minutes, it's not hours, it's not days, it's only a few seconds. And how much warning you get is going to be dependent on how far you are from the, the epicenter or where the earthquake originates. The closer you are, the less warning you get. Um, and we'll, I'll come back to, let's just finish the help. Yeah, for the next question, I'm gonna explain how, how the earthquake or er, early warning systems work and why you get the different um, lengths of why it depends on how close you are to get the, uh, the, the, how much time you get. So, so Erica, our, you know, you said that these are part of the notes, right? Yeah. So that, you know, if you, you as a, a hub person are thinking of hosting this, Erica's knowledge is captured for you. All this stuff she's reading is in the notes. You're not, you're not having to sit there tonight taking notes on this. So yep. I am actually, I'm actually reading my own notes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we have the slides, and then we have in the notes section of the slides are the links and all of the descriptions. So I have a description, and in almost most cases, I also have a link to a website. So you will all, so if you're using the slides that I generated, every single slide has a set of notes and explanations to go with the answers. That's a great best practice. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, because I don't remember all this stuff myself. <laughs> so that's why I'm like, I have notes because I'm reading the, the answers. I'm reading all that information myself. So what do we have? What's, what's, how does the earthquake warning system detect to trigger a warning? So as, as we mentioned, it's, we're not getting a lot of warning. So the inc it's not the increased strain on a fault. Um, it's not precursor earthquakes. We, as far as we know, that is, there's no such thing. Um, we have not, scientists have not been able to, to indicate that. Um, it's not changes in animal behavior. It's actually the early seismic waves at the beginning of an earthquake. So what happens during an earthquake when the, the faults move is there's two main type of waves of seismic waves that are generated. One that's called a P wave. It's a, it, or also called a compressional wave. And it is fat, it's not as intense shaking and it travels fast as it travels faster than the other type of wave called an S wave or a shear wave. The S wave moves slower, but is more destructive. What happens is because the P waves travel faster, the further they go, the more they, they come in ahead of the, the S waves, which is why the further you are from the epicenter, the more warning you get because the P waves are traveling faster. And so you get the earthquake early warning systems, the sensors pick up the P waves that are traveling faster and they very quickly send out an alert to everybody and it's on the system. And so that you get that few seconds of be able to brace before the more severe S waves or shear waves come that follow the P waves. Sure. So our, our uh, question four, uh, true or false, earthquake early warning systems are new technology that haven't been tested in large earthquakes? The answer is false. Um, the Japanese 2011 earthquake, actually, there's there's video of this of the earthquake early, early warning system showing up on TV. Their the their um, their uh, parliament or congressional body had some sort of debate going on, and the warning system. There's a recording of the warning system coming on the screens. Um, people's cell phones were going off, and the Japanese system came online in 2007. Uh, the California system came online last year in 2020. Um, they've probably had some small earthquakes, but Japan's 2011 earthquake is an example of where the earthquake early warning system warned people of an extraordinarily large warning, um, earthquake that was imminent in their area. 
So number five, which are examples of how earthquake early warning systems are used? Do they send, I'm gonna kind of scroll through this real quick because the answer is all of the above. So there's many um, uh, ways that earthquake early warning systems can be used. This is just a few. Uh, one example is, you know, you really don't want pe people really don't want to be stuck in an earthquake in an elevator during an earthquake. So just that few seconds is enough for an elevator to stop at the nearest floor and have the doors open. You only need a couple seconds for that to happen. Um, stopping trains and light rail uh, because of the shaking, this gives people the chance the doors will open if they're if they're not on an overpass. It's unfortunately not enough warning to send this train typically to send the trains or the light rail to the nearest station. But if they're in an area where opening the doors that would enable people to get out at when it's safe, that that can be done. Um, if you've got a few seconds of warning, you can dive under a table for um, protection or into a door jam. Um, and also there in Japan, they've also been used to, to set up triggers for assembly lines. The assembly lines will shut down and go into lockdown um, it, when, when a, or the early warning system activates. So there's actually even many more options or um, ways that the signals can be used. And again, like I mentioned, there's links. So there's, there's actually a really great graphic in the link that's in the note for all of the ways that earthquake early warning systems can be used. So after the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, how long would Seattle be out after, would Seattle be at risk for a tsunami in Puget Sound? Uh, so two to five minutes, 20, 30 minutes, it's not. The answer is oh. one to three hours. <laughs> that was, this is the one I wasn't sure about. <laughs> yeah, the, so, there's, there might be a little bit of shaking of the Puget Sound because of the earthquake. That is not a tsunami. That's something called a size instead, <laughs> where they've actually, you can actually see these sizes um, develop really far away. Uh, there was an earth, several years ago, there was an earthquake in Alaska. Absolutely nobody in Seattle felt it but there were like commercial pools at like gyms where the water just started as the earth, as the waves we couldn't feel started sending the pools um, sloshing around. There's actually, I have, so in the notes, there's a link to some simulations that have been done that the tsunami that would be generated coming towards the shore will actually, can actually propagate between the gap between um, northern the northern portion of Washington State and Vancouver Island and travel through that narrow inlet and then down into Puget Sound. We would then start seeing significant tsunami associated with that, but it will take about one to three hours for that, depending on where in Puget Sound, and that it's probably about, about a little over an hour to, a, to two hours when that the major brunt of a tsunami would would hit um, Puget Sound. So, um, and they they and it, they, they travel at 500. Typically, tsunamis travel at about 500 miles per hour. Or so, but it would still have to it goes up around the corner of Washington State and then down through that gap um, and then into Puget Sound. So, our our next uh, real question. <laughs> because <laughs> we've got one after that's our opinion. Um, so which is not a warning that a tsunami might be imminent for making landfall? So if we don't have um, any sort of, typically any, any area that is at risk for a tsunami usually have sirens um, and those might be triggered. But if you're in some place where there's not the sirens that could be triggered, uh, Water at a beach receding rapidly is a very much a sign that there is a tsunami imminent. Um, this is actually one of the, there have been multiple cases where there have been large number of losses of life because the water recedes out. People see the fish flopping around and they're like, oh, and they get very curious and they go out and minutes later is when the water comes back in. So if you are at the beach and you see the, the water recede rapidly, don't uh, stick around saying what's going on. There is a tsunami in a minute, so you should be getting to high ground as fast as possible in the opposite direction. Um, 
a loud roaring noise coming from the ocean is is a signal or a potential uh, way to tell you that there is a tsunami imminent. The actual answer is a tall wall of water coming towards the shore. Um, one of the things that's very deceptive about tsunamis is typically the waves that come in are not real tall. They can be 100 miles long, but typically the wall of water is only a few meters high. Uh, the, uh, yeah, so it was for in a few places in, in the coast of Japan for 2011, they did see a, a wave that was about six to nine feet high, but that's as high as was seen. So these are not tall waves. Typically, you don't even see that high of a wall of water. They're very long, but they're not high. Um, and local shaking is pretty much the rule is if you are near water and, and near a coastline and there you feel shaking, you are at potentially at risk for a tsunami. Just start heading to high ground. Just assume that that's, there's a tsunami coming. So, and then our, our question of which, uh, which uh, superhero would you recruit for your hub? So I'm gonna let the others, uh, the others uh, uh, share their answer as we uh, go back to, to scoring. Yeah, and, and the fun thing about this one is like last time um, I played, I usually get to be the scorekeeper and so, as I went from group to group and said, okay, give us your answer. We asked him to say, okay, tell us what your score was if you've been able to add it up as you go along and then tell us which one you guys picked and why. And sometimes that's interesting for people to hear. So I picked yeah. Groot. I oh, want, okay. I want well, someone who can barter. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I picked Iron Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not sure why. Yep. Yeah, I, I think so. Well, I, I actually will have been known to dress up as Wonder Woman when I do costuming. I have my own Wonder Woman costume. I think I, I would still pick Rocket that. and Groot. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the scrappy um, behavior is uh, we, we, you're going to need is their their resourcefulness. <laughs> so I agree with would agree with you, Cindy. Yep. So so your scorekeeper is going to go around to all the teams, get the number, have a little fun. And then we reset and we go, okay, now we're gonna go into round two and uh, pick it up from there. And really, now we'll get to see what it's like when you actually have an audience you have to play with. And there's gonna be two lightning rounds. Uh, the first round we're going to do name the hazard sign. I'm going to give you only 10 seconds per sign to come up with an answer. So there will be no going back through a second time. And we're going to score both of these together. Yeah, so we'll score these both together. It's just two different sets of, of visual rounds. So everyone ready to go for our lightning round. First hazard sign. Next hazard sign. Sign number three. Sign number four. And our last sign. Okay, so that's our first lightning round. Our next lightning round, you'll have more time. I will give you 30 seconds for each image and it's name the disaster movie. So each question has two parts. Um, so each question will have two points. Um, you'll get one point for naming the movie title and another point for naming the disaster that is depicted in the movie. So here we are, remember movie title and the actual disaster. There's a two parts for each image from a movie. So our first movie.
Now we're going to move on to the second movie. So third movie. Fourth movie. And our last movie. Go into our breakout rooms uh, and you're gonna uh, have discussed with you in your breakout rooms and we'll come back and go through the answers. Well, we were not done, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> we decided in the Northwest that we don't watch enough movies. Enough <laughs> yeah. I saw none of those movies. <laughs> yeah. Answers now for our lightning round. So name that hazard sign. First one was risk of earthquake. Ooh. So we have a little seismic wave there. Second one was flooding risk. Third one, uh, one we a little more familiar than we probably want to be with right now, biohazard. Mm. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Sign number four, radiation. And then our final sign, Zombie infestation. <laughs> no, really? <laughs> for scoring purposes, if you had anything around the zombie theme, it's a, yes. it's a point. It, okay, so now on to the disaster movies. So remember, this is you get two points. One point for both the one point for the movie title and one point for the disaster that is depicted in the movie. So our first one movie is Pompeii. And the disaster is a volcanic eruption. If you also say pyroclastic flow, something along that lines, you get full credit for that as well. Our second movie, Little Too Close to Home, Contagion, and the disaster is a pandemic. <laughs> Which if, uh, as we now know, this would be more accurate if it was all the toilet paper that was gone. Uh, or, or if it was a movie about snowpocalypse two years ago. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, our third movie. Uh, this one I will say is a very good movie. I have watched this movie multiple times. This one is Twister, um, and the disaster is tornado or tornadoes, uh, multiple tornadoes. I swear, I was looking at those, going, "Is this Sharknado? Did I miss something here?" <laughs> <laughs> Our fourth movie, um, as far as I know, Anne maybe held the distinction for the only one I've seen, having seen this one so far, um, San Andreas, and the movie is, or the, the disaster is an earthquake. This one apparently is not on the recommended list to see. No. <laughs> Don't waste your time. Neither's the next one. Oh, I really like that. I love the next one. I love the next one. I love next the next one's a classic. One. So the next one, our final one is Shaun of the Dead and our disaster is a zombie invasion. <laughs> Yay! That was, that was great. Fun. Yeah, that was fun. That was good. You guys, and you guys were champs at not, you know, getting confused about the breakout rooms and stuff yeah. like that. So, so Erica. Oh, I'm going to real quick show you the documents if you want to um, be able to do something similar. Um, so I'm going to grab control of the screen again. And, so. and Ann and I can both run Zoom accounts for you because you definitely need a technical person. Um, the times I've seen one guy try to do it all, it's, it's sad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in our hub captain's documents, um, share, share drive, um, the planning meeting minutes a uh, planning committee meeting minutes folder will disappear. Um, that was me hiding it. So uh, something sounding extraordinarily boring that no one wanted to look in. Um, you will find it, you will be uh, eventually find a disaster trivia folder. 
Um, within the disaster trivia folder, there is a readme file um, that I wrote up uh, sort of explaining which fold, what all of these different folders are, and also gives some of the tips about that we put together for how to run this and you know the goals that we set up. Um, and then, so the master files are the ones that sort of come from the re resources that we have, uh, that we started from. You know, they will see that they're very long. They have the answers. Um, this is if you want to sort of go back to see and maybe sort of rethink some of the questions, or if you want to decide, you know, let's let's look at what they um, uh, what the source was and maybe sort of modify the question slightly. Um, trivia rounds. Now, this is what Mo helped extensively with. She took the master files and broke up everything into every file in here it can form a round so there is and there's a, a little letter in here so trivia night notes so it talks about the fact that in, like for an in-person one the optimal right number of questions um, and timing is about a half an hour per round and so each one of these files would be a half an hour round uh, so and, and like I, I split the disaster films and the hazard signs I broke them up and had it so that you got half of one and half for the other for a round. Um, this has it set so you'd have 10 slides for each one of those. So this is, so you would grab, depending on how long you want your trivia sections to be, um, you would grab one of these. For our purposes, I was taking a sampling of each of, uh, from different places. So the, what, the folders and the files that I used for tonight are, are the trivia rounds one and two, and then the answer ones that have the answers included in the slides. Uh, so this is our, what are the resources you have available, available to you in the Hub Captain's documents. Actually, Erica, when you send it and you get, the, get it in place, when I send out the minutes and the link to the video from this tonight's deep dive, I'll include the link to the files too. Okay. I am going to stop there momentarily. So um, this is an opportunity for if you've got questions about how to do this. Um, you know, Cindy's mentioned that they would help with the technical aspect. Mo is here. If anybody's got questions about how you run, um, particularly an in-person trivia session, when we can get back to doing that, um, uh, if you've got some some uh, ideas for that. Or, or questions about how you might run that yourself, uh, feel free. This is now our Q&A section of the, the, the evening. So I'll say, I think that if there is a prize, it should go to Mo because it sounds like <laughs> Mo did all the heavy lifting and it, that was really fun. Yeah, that was a good idea. Yeah, great idea. People yeah. will- um, Engaging, yeah. Yeah, and especially now that we're doing stuff online, you know, I think it uh, will, it adapts really well to that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else got any questions or observations? And I see some comments in here saying, thank you. Good job. It was a great, that was a nice timing for practice and a good e example for us to follow. Thank you very much, Erica. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you, Mo. <laughs> Lots of work that we can't even see. Um, yeah. All right, unless anybody else has anything else, we'll let you go on time. Yay. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Bye, yeah, thanks for putting everyone. That was great. Bye. Good to see everyone.